you may not make a lot of money trying to do what you want to do, what you love. Um, but in the end, that's a more valuable process. I mean, even just spiritually, it's more valuable to like pursue your dream or your goal rather than giving, giving it away for a few bucks. Um, ultimately, I think it's better to have a, different, a second job than to give away your, your dream, <laughs> you know, to, to make a few dollars. And, I, and I've, definitely seen, I've definitely learned that from her. And, uh, you know, Tucker and Dale making this film was kind of a life goal for me. It was like, I don't know if I'll ever make another film. At the time, I was like, I don't know if I'll ever be able to do this again. Maybe this will be the worst film ever, but I have to do this in my life. Like, I have to accomplish this one goal. Um, you know, and I've set a lot of, like, step-by-step -step goals like that for myself. And, and so I, I was really, like, just very focused, almost obsessed on just seeing this film through. So you've shot hey. one, you directed one shot, show what's on Venice. Well, I directed um, a short, I directed some music videos and commercials, and then I produced a lot of stuff, like especially commercials and music videos. Um, so I was working as a line producer a lot, which was really helpful because I could go back into the budget and help out with Tucker and Dale. Um, and then before that I was doing um, some acting before I went back to film school. Uh, and, uh, and trained with a great acting coach named Larry Moss. But eventually I just was like, acting isn't for me. I don't really, I prefer to be behind the camera and I prefer to like try to work with um, talented actors to create that like energy to performance, that like moment that can just live once. Like you see a, a one take that's just a, so alive and so in the moment and, um, and just real. And that's always what, I, you know, that's what I'm going for, maybe, is just trying to create a sense of realism even within the sort of heightened reality of Tucker and Dale. I want to ask about prejudge what you said. I really enjoy this film because of um, it lasts so much more than what's your number, which I just covered the junket this morning. Mm. And I usually don't like horror movie, but I really enjoy this film. And uh, what I really like this film is about, it's, yeah, it's a horror comedy, but it's also described about the people's prejudge. Yeah. So as you have a famous mom, and you know, yeah. people always label people someone else. Is this kind of coming from your experience, prejudge <laughs> experience or label? Yeah. Maybe? Well, I've thought a lot about this. Sometimes you don't get a chance to really think about, I mean, you just do it and then there's parts of yourself that end up obviously being in, in your work. To me, it, it, it's a bit of a, um, I guess it's a bit of a metaphor for my life because I grew up with my father who was a con construction worker and lived most of the time in, in Oregon. I helped him build a cabin. In fact, I remember once my dad uh, literally cut into a tree and, and hit a uh, bee's nest. And we were on a lake, and he goes running by with his chainsaw over his head, bees, bees, and he throws the chainsaw and dove into the lake. An original script, that's the way it was, because I was like, it was one of the, it was, I was l laughing at that time, I didn't know it would be in, the, in a script. But the dichotomy between that life, which was very much outdoorsy and, um, kind of of the, of the earth and salt of the earth kind of thing. And, and then living part-time in LA and being a part of the Hollywood world. And, and, um, and then, you know, so that was a little bit more maybe elitist, even though I always rejected that notion that it was. Um, and so I think this film kind of comedic, comedically postures those two entities against themselves, like this elitist world and the, the hillbilly world. And, and ultimately, I like that the Tucker and Dale characters are smarter than the college kids, you know? They're, they're actually, even though they aren't as well educated, there's a line in there that, um, where Katrina Bowden says there's a difference between education and intellect. And I've always found that in my life, like the most educated people in the world are not always, the, are rarely actually the smartest. And uh, so I, it's a big, I guess that's a, that's a dichotomy in my life that I kind of brought out a bit in Tucker and Dale. I've noticed, because uh, I have a horse ranch, um, mm -hmm. you talk about those worlds being like that, but it also helps you balance that too. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you had three worlds. You had your mom, you had Los Angeles, and then you had part-time with your dad. So yeah. you learn balance, and then when you you bring in the, the music industry, obviously, you know, it's a whole another world. So you, yeah. I'm happy that you got this done, because you know it's hard to get done, so. Oh, for sure, yeah. I mean, yeah, it, but it's just, um, I think we all, no matter if you're if you're an artist, you try to find these things in your life that you can sort of grow into larger metaphors. And um, I, the fun of this for me was that 
I always feel like people misinterpret uh, both worlds. Like I always feel like people misinterpret me when they see me just as my mother's son. It, it lay, puts this layer of, um, of, of sort of, it's not, it's not prejudice, but it's prejudging on top of something. And then I've always felt like people misinterpreted me when I'd be up in the woods like with my dad and people would be like, oh, this guy's just some redneck, you know? And, and either way, I grew up in these two worlds that were both sort of prejudged and you can, going from one to the other, you could see it in people's eyes and you could see it just like that on how people treat you. And uh, so when I thought Tucker and Dale, I mean, Dale sees a cute girl across the way and he's like, like any guy, like, wow, check out that cute girl. And he's looking at her. And of course, she's looking at him thinking he's thinking he wants to kill her or something. When in reality, he's just looking at a cute girl. So um, if he were a cute guy, you know, that was at, on college campus, she may be giving him eyes too. But it's, so it's all about perception. On that, uh, Tyler Levine is such an uncharacteristic lead, and he has such great heart in this film, and he really helps sell the emotion of it. How did you land on him? And you said you didn't have very much rehearsal time. How did uh, they strike up that amazing chemistry that you see on the screen? Well, Tyler I had a little more time with, because Tyler, um, I was searching for the guy who had played Dale for a while, um, <clears throat> and I, I had a lot of qualifications. I mean, he had to look like he could be, uh, evil, I guess. He had to look big and somewhat menacing, and, and yet he had to have this like shining light in his eyes. He had to be this heart of gold. That even under, even with blood all over him, I want him to feel like a big teddy bear. And uh, so you go looking, you're like, where am I gonna find this guy? And um, I didn't think of it as first, but I had been watching this show Reaper sure, a little okay. bit. And uh, he was always stealing the scenes, and he was a, it was a big, broadly comic role, but I thought, you know what? Here's a pretty good act. He's funny. At least he's really funny and he could look the part. So I went back and I watched some of his other stuff, including a TV show called Invasion, where it was much, his character was much more nuanced. And, and I thought, this is a real actor. He's a real actor. And I sent him the, um, I convinced the producers of it and we sent him an offer about a month before. And uh, I think he was really flattered because, you know, he doesn't get like a lot of offers to play a leading role. And, and he got it. He totally got the script. Um, and we met shortly after and discussed his role and, um, and he signed on board. But um, it wasn't for another, it wasn't until like three days before going to camera that we got Alan Tudyk. And, and he was really um, a godsend on this because he was just so, he's a Juilliard actor, he's so trained and everything had to come from a place of realism. Uh, so, so it was a good combination between so the two. Can, can you talk a little bit about like the, the gore scenes? I mean, there's a lot of gore in this movie. Pretty well done. Was your first feature? Do you have like? You surely have some like interesting stories about <laughs> some of the stuff that you show. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, that, I was nervous. I don't know. I, I I tried to plan a lot for those scenes. I mean, fortunately, it ends up a lot of the action scenes went, were very quickly shot. I mean, we'd shoot a lot of that stuff in one take. Everything was storyboarded, and um, I have to say, I was kind of going off of um, two films. One was uh, American Werewolf in London where I thought the gore was, was pushed to a degree at the time, and they, they, they had a lot of cool gore. And then uh, Shaun of the Dead, also where they didn't shy away from it. Um, and then I, I, I wanted to take it maybe a little further and make it a little more splatter gore in certain places where I thought it could be really funny. Um, but, you know, for instance, when, the, like, there's one scene where the kid falls into a wood chipper, you know, and oh. yeah, Tucker's yeah. wrestling to try to pull him out. But from the college kid's angle, I wanted it to kind of look also like he might be stuffing him into the wood chipper. And then blood sprays out of the top. And then um, I have Shalan Ch Simmons, um, who's playing Chloe in this. They're kind of hiding behind a log. And blood comes flying out of the wood chipper and into her face. And so one of the comedic plays is that wherever she is, she constantly keeps hitting, getting hit by like blood. And uh, we just had these big water rockets. It was like a water rocket, whatever. You know, it was a big PVC pipe with a, with a uh, syringe on it. And on action, I had two guys aim one on the chest and one on her face. And they both shot on action, but they both hit her in the face. And they missed her chest. And, <laughs> and I yelled cut. And I was just laughing. We were all laughing so hard. And I was like, they were like, are we going again? And I looked and was like, we don't have time to go again. That's it. We got it. I mean, and so some of it was kind of like, like I meant for the blood to hit her face and her chest, and it all hit her face, and I found it to be funnier. Um, so some of it is just like 
the the moment, you know, and it's like let's let's go with that. But yeah. how did you prepare for that? I mean, I don't know if your short movie was about horror or it was just a different genre. Oh no, were, were you like were you like kind of? Did you knew anything about like making horror sequences or gory? Things? No, no, I mean I studied, I watched a lot, um, and but my other films were more in the comedy, uh, you know, and more of a comedy genre. So I was worried about it. So I, I studied it a lot. I, I sort of uh, did all the storyboards, and the guy we were working up there with the special effects guy, Dave Trainer, he had a lot of prosthetics. And when I went into his place, he had prosthetics heads and prosthetic bodies, and. That was something we had a little bit of prep time with. I had a few weeks to create this body mold that was like a half body. Um, we even had a shot of through a head, like when a kid shot himself in the head, I had a shot through the skull, um, but I didn't keep that in the movie because it felt a little bit too much. I didn't want a gratuitous gore. It was this balance between, it, the gore had to be a part of the comedy, and when it wasn't, I pretty much cut it out. Last question, please, guys. You just said um, you ran out of time with the girl who, the third one, all over. Mm. But you said you ran out of time for that shot. Mm. I ran out of time for a second take. I mean, that's the way it was a lot of times in the shoot. I mean, we had like one or two takes a lot. And I would just, we would just roll with it, what we got. So you so. had a schedule that said you've got to do this. Well, it, we'd have to be wrapped by 11, we'd have to be wrapped in 11 and a half hours. And I'd have between 20 and 30 shots to do every day. And so um, it, to clean up the girl, bring her down, go to the makeup trailer, clean her all up, make her look like she hadn't been splashed with blood, and then shoot it again would have taken us over our day, and we were allowed no overtime. So there were a lot of times where um, we had to get it in the moment, and um, I think it added to an energy of the production as well, because T uh, Tyler and Alan and everybody would be on set with me, uh, they didn't have time to go back to their trailers. Makeup would be done in the chair a lot, you know, sitting next to camera, and and sitting there in the mud, down in the mosquito-infested woods for the whole shoot. And uh, in the end, I think it sort of added to the camaraderie, the feeling of camaraderie on the on the set. They didn't hurt you. They <laughs> might have a little bit. What's but, next? Um, I'm working on a uh, one of the things I sort of a passion project. One other things is is doing something similar with the. Uh, the whole devil child genre, and uh, I want, I'm doing a movie where I kind of subvert uh, the exorcist, sort of like a, um, the omen meets meet the parents, and so an uh, unsuspecting guy gets married into a family that the, his stepson ends up being the Antichrist, <laughs> and uh, he has to try to solve the, uh, has to try to figure out what to do with that child. If you. Uh and you, you said you did a lot of research and everything. It's, if you could name one slasher or monster that you felt was particularly misunderstood. Leatherface, come on. <laughs> Leatherface is terribly misunderstood. Um, and Jason, you know, Jason has a good backstory where, where he's just in anguish over being mistreated a long time ago. Uh, the good horror films always have these backstories that give them a reason for why they're committing the atrocities. I think as of late, they've gotten a little bit more Cavalier with those backstories. I mean, you, I don't think you see um, what's his name from uh, 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 what's the guy from um, what's the clown guy? The clown uh, from Saw. Jigsaw. Jigsaw. Yeah, I don't think Jigsaw has much backstory. I don't know. I don't think so. But uh, I like I like that they do have backstory because it makes them sort of sympathetic characters. Um, but I, I think Leatherface was just a sadly misunderstood kid. <laughs>